one night it was raining, pouring down rain. It was February, it was in 1982. People started crying the blues. They were wet, soaking wet. They didn't have no place to go. There were no shelters in this town. Um, and they were just standing out in the rain by my camper. And I said, this is enough. And we decided to form a group called the Homeless People's Association. Who are the homeless people? More specifically, and I found this is, this came out of Washington, and it's tough to get statistics about the homeless. Well, I had never been homeless before and had went and volunteered some services. And I always thought that homeless people were, you know, dirty, that they, they wanted to be in the situation that they were in. And it was an idea that had been developed because of watching TV. I'd never associated with any homeless people before. So it was like a media type of idea that I had developed from non-experience. And slowly, I had to change my attitude to um, to a different to maybe a different idea, a different way of thinking. Well, what I've noticed, the media has a problem for the last two years of trying to find a typical homeless person that they can talk to, because they just aren't there. And if they are, they don't want to be identified. Uh, we seem to have created homelessness as a topic that we can all discuss safely but we don't seem to be contacting the homeless or even aware of who the homeless are or what they want. We're trying to make decisions for the homeless. We're not talking to the homeless. We're not listening to the homeless, but it's a hard thing to do because the homeless aren't talking. And that's just a reality of they, the way they perceive themselves in this society. They're not important, so why should they say anything? It's uh, the very silent, a growing silent majority in this country. When I was on the streets, I was living in the van. I was employed. I was a single woman uh, living in this van. I didn't exist. I, I didn't fit any of the pigeonholes, according to the social services, because there's been this whole myth about what homeless people are, and I didn't fit any of those, uh, those little pigeonholes that you're supposed to be in. You know, I wasn't a drunk. I, I've been clean and sober almost 11 years. I don't drink, I don't use, I work, and I just didn't fit. has been on the streets for, you know, a number of years, since he was seven. Or actually, what would you say, since he was about five. Um, and we've been uprooted so many times. It's really troubled him. But he's been troubled because his mom's been troubled and his mom's been stressed out practically all of his life, even by the time, because I lived, his father was an alcoholic, and I didn't know. The, anything about alcohol. We live out in the streets like I get two government checks on them. I get a Navy pension and SSI. All about six hundred some dollars a month. I can't afford the apartment. How can I pay five hundred some dollars a month for an apartment? I can't work. So what am I going to do? I wouldn't say, I don't, I don't want to go as far as to say we're famous, but we don't hide. Uh, we think we should be allowed to live out here, and uh, so we do it. Um, and we, we do it in a way that they can't really get mad at us because we're doing it in, you know, in front of them. I don't know why they're mad at us for doing it. Um, just because it's in front of them, you know, what? There's not homeless people on the streets? It's because you can't see them. They're all hiding because they get hassled. I don't, we don't want to put up with that. So. 
We do what we can to survive. We go to jail once in a while for doing it, and we're still doing it. There's always going to be somebody doing it. I'm here because I live here. You know, I mean, if I was from Louisiana, okay, and I was in Santa Barbara, I'd be a transient. But I'm from here, and this is where I live. And this is where I'm going to live. This is where I was born. And I feel, okay, there's animals have places to live. Everybody has a place to live. Why not people? Let me give you some rough statistics, and then I'm going to read you a couple things that really, I think, help you understand the diversity of the homeless population. Roughly, a third are families with children. A third are mentally ill. A third are substance abusers, either drug or alcohol, or both, which is very complex. The fastest growing uh, population of the homeless nationally, and I believe this will probably be borne out in, Long in Santa Barbara, is uh, single women with children. Both my kids have been blessed with super uh, brains on them. Sean's 13 and Crystal is four and a half. And if you meet Crystal, you'll fall in love. She's a little doll baby. She's a pain in the rear end, but she's a doll baby at the same time. A very loving child, and she's talented. She likes to take a microphone and sing, and, and she likes to get up on stage and do a number, dance numbers and things like this. She's very outgoing. and. Her, this homeless life hasn't affected Crystal. She's just a go-getter. I mean, she, she's, she gets what she wants. She wants something, she'll go out and get it. But she'll also, also ask for it. I mean, is it okay if I do this? And I've always brought her up to be, when she was a little baby, I kept her always with me, like a chimpanzee would. And I have taught her how to relate to people. There are a couple of primary reasons that uh, uh, these uh, economic forces are, are, are working on us. First, um, the economy has changed. Uh, we're retooling for a, a high-tech information kind of economy. And the old standby manufacturing trades, auto manufacturing in the Midwest and shoes up in New England, uh, the factories have been closing at an alarming rate. And by and large, people who'd been making a decent living, a union wage from these kinds of jobs, have found themselves working at a poverty wage. And when you cut $25 billion a year, putting back a billion or two or $3 billion just doesn't do it. We feel that the crisis in homelessness today, the 3 million homeless people out on the streets, are directly the result of Reagan cutbacks in affordable housing and services. There have been programs in the city of Santa Barbara for a very long time. Salvation Army has existed for 100 years in Santa Barbara. I've seen old newspaper stories from the 30s in which they report on the hundreds of homeless men that they had helped during the depths of the Depression. So the Salvation Army has been here for a very long time. We have social services and outreach groups and, you know, help facilities. They try to tend to kind of counsel people to, um, to get them job training, things like this. I think more should be done on, the, on dropping the cost of living so these people that do have, you know, one, two, three, or four kids can really afford to live. We're spending somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars a year on services for the homeless for the direct services that are provided at places like Transition House. Uh, there are over 30 churches in the community that help uh, financially and with actual work at the shelter, uh, acting as monitors at night. I think the community has responded wonderfully to the problem. The 
The rescue mission is in a new facility on city land, land that they bought from the city. We made it available to them at fair market value, but uh, land was scarce and most people don't want it, that kind of facility in their backyard. So um, we facilitated the construction of the new facility, which can serve many more people than their original one that was on State Street. There's Catholic Social Services, which helps provide uh, help to individuals and families that are homeless. It's made a holy or a sacred occasion by the feeling that Janet and James have for one another. And I think in some way, the jungle where we're standing could be considered holy ground. Oscar Wilde, when he got out of jail and had been quite humbled, said, where there is sorrow, there is holy ground. And all of us know that for 50 years at least, where we're standing has been where people in trouble and people at odds with themselves or with life, or people with no place else to go, and certainly people with no home, have come with their sorrows in order to find some place in which they could exist. As far as the homeless are concerned, it's illegal to be poor in this county because if you're homeless, you have no place to sleep. If you're going to sleep in the county, you're going to be breaking the law. If you're going to be sleeping in the city, you're going to be breaking the law against camping. So uh, as a result, the courts have recently become clogged with these kinds of cases. Uh, taxpayers are footing the bill. Uh, it's very expensive, and it's um, reminiscent of Anatole France, who once said that the law, in its majestic equality, prohibited the rich as well as the poor from stealing, begging for bread, and sleeping under britches. The one thing that a marriage does beneath all the words which are spoken and the vows which are taken is to be a kind of ceremony in which the people who are marrying one another are in effect saying to each other, I will be your home. And they offer themselves, and they offer their hearts and their bodies and their souls and all their energy and their will in saying to the other person, if you have no place else to be, you can be with me. So housing Now is a nationwide movement to create more affordable housing. It's being sponsored by the Center for Creative Nonviolence, which is Mitch Schneider's organization in Washington, D.C., and the National Coalition for the Homeless. What's going to be happening in the fall, on October 7th to be exact, has its roots back in January of this year in Atlanta, Georgia, when uh, about 200 of us got together, people representing just about every major national organization in the country dealing with housing and homelessness, as well as a significant number of homeless people. We came together to try and determine where we go from here or more accurately from there. And in the course of those two days, we determined a couple of things. The first was that as a movement, we are right now in a position of very great strength. And that is primarily for two reasons. One, that there's a large and thankfully growing number of people in this country who are disturbed, who are angered, by the fact that there are millions of human beings in the United States that have no place to live. There are a far larger number of people that are deeply and personally concerned about the fact that there is virtually no affordable housing left because it deeply and personally affects them. Beyond homeless people, beyond poor people, there are tens of millions of folks in this country who are either spending ridiculous percentages of their income on a place to live, who are living doubled and tripled and quadrupled up, 